So I have the pleasure of, of being the first speaker uh, this morning, uh, most likely because the human genome is really the place where human traits and, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the aspect of humans that bespo bestows upon us these, uh, these uh, you know, uniquely human qualities that we have. Incidentally, the human genome is also, um, it's variation in the human genome that actually explains a lot of the, the underlying causes of autism at the same time. So it makes sense that we would start to focus on this. What is it about the human genome that influences human evolution? What is it about the human genome that it actually uh, influences your risk of disease? So I'm gonna cover in this lecture some basic understanding of how genes and genetic variation in the genome relate to autism. And then I'm gonna jump to a, a more fundamental aspect of human genomics, which is how does mutation happen? And how do patterns of mutation actually influence human evolution and disease? And as you'll see, um, by the time we get to the conclusion of the talk, the two are inextricably linked. It's, uh, it's important to kind of re-unearth some of the scientific fact that's been around for decades now. And uh, the ones that are sort of most unequivocal are the twin studies, which back in the mid-90s Scientists had cobbled together identical twins, fraternal twins, and started to look within families uh, to see if there was a genetic contribution to the disease. And it was very obvious early on that compared to the 1% prevalence in the population, if you had a sibling with autism, your risk of also developing autism was about 10 to 20%, 10 to 20-fold higher than the population risk. If you were a fraternal twin of someone with autism, your risk was about the same as a sibling, roughly 10 to 20%. But if you were genetically identical to your sibling, if you were an identical twin, then your risk of also having, being on the autism spectrum was 70 to 90%. So this was some pretty compelling evidence back in the 90s that autism, uh, that genetics was, uh, played an important role in, in your risk. Despite this, there was a lot of struggle over the early decade uh, in terms of finding autism genes. Uh, with the tools that we had available at the time, linkage analysis, signals were coming from all over the genome. There was virtually not a single chromosome untouched from linkage studies. When, when intelligent neuroscientists made a hypothesis about a gene that might be involved and one sequenced it in 50 cases, you rarely found a mutation in that gene. And so the candidate gene studies weren't particularly uh, fruitful. What did turn out to be fruitful early on were cytogenetic studies, studies of, of the actual karyotypes of patients revealed that chromosome abnormalities could be found in about 5% of cases. And also, there were a series of rare syndromes which were starting to pop up inside of the autism population. And this included Fragile X, Rett syndrome, uh, tuberous sclerosis, and an, a, a few different sort of brain overgrowth syndromes that there are core features to the disorder. But in addition to these core features, which essentially affect one's ability to interact in a human fashion, socially interact and communicate, there are a, a, quite a wide variety of other features which are often associated with autism but are not part of the core diagnosis. This includes sensory problems, epilepsy, uh, intellectual disability, motor problems, and autoimmune problems are frequently reported uh, in cases but are not a defining characteristic of the disorder. So this degree of heterogeneity, the, the, the things that were not core features but were clearly part of the disease in some subset of cases, uh, this, the extent to which this type of heterogeneity was, was occurring suggested that this was not a simple disorder. And I'm going to jump straight to the punchline uh, to try to just give a little foreshadowing of what is it about the genome that explains all this heterogeneity, and it, is, it has to do with the way the genome mutates. It has to do with mutability in our genome. So spontaneous germline mutation plays an important role in quite a number of human disorders. For a severe neurodevelopmental disorder, for a disorder where if you are affected, the likelihood of, of marrying, uh, holding down a job, having kids, um, is greatly impaired. And so this particular human trait is one which does not tend to select for, uh, that where, where, where the, if a gene carries a lot of risk, it's not a gene that's gonna be transmitted over lots of generations. It's a gene that might spontaneously occur in the population, but won't sit around for long. So that's exactly what happens. These kinds of alleles segregate over a few generations, and they're often actually observed as a spontaneous mutation in the patient. Um, in order to understand the contribution of these kinds of risk factors to the disease, we have to actually understand the mutational processes that give rise to human genetic diversity and the forces that, that shape them. So we've kind of 
our first insight into this aspect of the genome um, came from some studies that uh, Mike Wiggler at Cold Spring Harbor and myself did in, uh, in the uh, early 2000s where a particular kind of variation in the genome known as copy number variation uh, started to become uh, apparent to us as actually a major form of genetic variation. Just to define you what I mean here, every gene uh, in your genome is generally present in two copies, one that you inherited from your father and one that you inherited from your mother. Copy number variation is when the gene on one of those chromosomes could potentially delete or duplicate, can actually vary in the number of copies that are present. So you can have, instead of the normal two copies, you could have a duplication and have three copies, or you could have a deletion, and you'll only have maybe your mother's copy, and you'll only have one copy. Uh, so this is, this is the kind of genetic variation that in the early 2000s we had the ability to look at. Uh, so when, uh, when Dr. Wiggler and I started lo looking at this within autism, there was one thing that really jumped out to us right away, and that was the fact that if you, if you did genome scans of mom, dad, and the kid, and you looked at the affected sibling, or you looked at the, uh, the typically developing sibling in a family, one thing that jumped out at us was the fact that in cases of autism, we could find a spontaneous mutation that was not inherited from the parent in about 10% of kids. And these are, this is only one class of mutation, by the way. We're not looking at all mutations. We're just looking at big chunks of the genome that spontaneously delete or duplicate. That's present in 10% of cases of autism. When we looked at the healthy siblings, we saw that in about 1% of the time. So there was a tenfold difference in the, the frequency of these things between an affected child and their healthy sibling. And sure enough, we've now looked at this across a lot of autism cases. We've looked across multiple psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And this actually appears to be a characteristic not specifically of autism, but of, of, of severe neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders in general. There's a very significant contribution from rare mutations, including mutations that occurred very recently in the family history. And when you start to focus in on these things, they really start to have very, A, very significant effects on risk, and also they also have uh, some kind of uh, clinical, they tend to favor certain clinical phenotypes. So here's a nice example. The, this is chromosome 16P11.2. A deletion in this region has, carries a high risk of autism and intellectual disability. So you have about a tenfold increased risk of having significant uh, developmental delay, IQ of 70 or below. You also have significant risk of having autism. Does not carry much risk, if any, of other psychiatric disorders. Now, at the same site in the genome, this is a hot spot where mutations happen frequently. You can also have duplications of the same gene. When you have duplications of the same genes, I apologize, it's actually 28 genes, you also carry risk of autism if you duplicate the same genes. Uh, but there's a difference with the duplication is that it also carries risk of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So you have, you have genes that can delete, you have genes that can duplicate, and you have contrasting sort of clinical presentations for the deletion and the duplication. The deletion is specific to autism and, and developmental delay. The duplication, slightly milder, slightly milder uh, traits, and also a, a broader sort of psychiatric uh, risk. Now, we've looked at other sites in the genome that are like this as well. Chromosome 1 has one of these hot spots where the deletion carries high risk of schizophrenia, no risk of autism, no risk of bipolar disorder. But you flip it around, and the duplication of exactly the same region now primarily associated with autism. So you have regions in the genome where reciprocal changes in the DNA produce reciprocal phenotypes. And we actually have cases where autism and schizophrenia are at opposite ends of the genetic extreme. Another classic example now is Williams syndrome, which some of you may be familiar with and is notable with uh, regard to how, how well adjusted the, the affected children tend to be. This is actually referred to as the hypersocial disease. The duplication of Williams syndrome, significant risk factor for autism. So Williams syndrome and autism are yet another example of extremes. They truly are neurobiological, genetic, and and phenotypic extremes. Uh, so we've started to look more at the characteristics. Um, head size is significantly affected, which is kind of our first link into a neurobiological uh, trait. So deletion of chromosome 16 increases a larger head size and larger brain volume by about a standard deviation, and duplication has a reduced head size. And of course, this is now turning out to be a recurring theme. If you delete the 16P genes, you have brain overgrowth and association with autism. If you duplicate, you have brain undergrowth and 
more risk of schizophrenia bipolar. Exactly the same thing is true on chromosome one. The deletion is associated with microcephaly and schizophrenia. The duplication is associated with macrocephaly and autism. So there's a direct link between the genes and there's a direct link between brain, uh, between reg you know, abnormal regulation of brain growth and autism. So to conclude this section, there, is, there are regions of the genome that are unequivocally identified and we're starting to gain some insight into the neurobiological uh, pathways involved and the, um, uh, the clinical relevance. Now, jumping ahead to the second section of my talk, this has nothing to do with C and Vs in particular. This happened to be the first flavor of variation that we could really get a handle on. Um, in fact, there are other flavors of variation in the genome that appear to be doing exactly the same thing. We had four studies published back to back to back in Nature and Neuron just a few months ago, which clearly showed exactly the same thing is going on if you focus on on changes in the DNA sequence level. Instead of looking at copy number changes, if you just sequence the gene and you look for mutations that are present in the child and not in their uh, parents, there are some of these sequence changes, specifically the ones that disrupt the gene, that have significant uh, increase uh, prevalence in the affected kids. So we wanted to start to get a handle on this. So the contribution of rare genetic variants to autism is determined by patterns of de novo mutation in the genome. And we're now, we're now so, the exome gave us some very important clues. We're now focusing on a whole genome sequencing uh, to try to get a handle on what's really going on, what factors, what, what characteristics in the genome are really driving this, and, uh, and is there, some, is there, something, are there some, some things about the genome that seem to favor mutation in certain regions? We knew that there were CNV hotspots. Are there also nucleotide substitution hotspots? Are there other kinds of hotspots? So we've done this comprehensive study of genetic variation. So we sequenced the complete genomes of mom, dad, and a pair of identical twins, which both had autism, and we did this for 10 different families. Uh, we processed their genome sequences through our internal pipeline at the supercomputing center at uh, UCSD, and um, we've, we've, we've comprehensively validated everything by multiple uh, genetic techniques. And obviously there was one thing that jumped out right away, and you probably heard about this in the, in the uh, media quite recently. It's actually something we got scooped on, because uh, our paper is still under review, and this was published a few weeks ago in Nature. So an Icelandic group showed that if you're an older father, mutations accumulate in your constantly dividing spermatogonial cells, and so older fathers give more mutations uh, to their offspring. And uh, this was already predicted going back to 1935, but finally we have the tools to actually look at it, and sure enough, it's true. According to our data, um, a father, every additional year you wait to have your child, that's just one extra mutation in the genome, compared to the average of 50 that are there already. So it, it's not as if older fathers are, are somehow, you know, causing autism. That's not it at all. It's a very tiny marginal increase in risk every additional year, year that you wait. It's, you have 51 mutations instead of 50. You wait another year, it's 52 mutations. So it's, it's, it's not causal of autism. It simply means that the burden of mutations grows, you know, incrementally as men age. Now, in addition to that, there's variation in rate in the population, and most of the variation in mutation rates from one individual to the next is actually explained by their father's age. Now, looking not at the, not looking genome-wide at the total burden, looking at different regions and looking at the rate within different regions, it appears to be there's actually quite a lot of variation there as well. So there are very hot regions of the genome, and there are some very cold regions of the genome. And we've now tried to use some statistical algorithms to actually make estimates of mutation rate, and uh, you, trying to incorporate the intrinsic properties of the genome, and, and trying to see how much, of, how much of the intrinsic characteristics seem to explain this regional variation in mutation rate. And as it turns out, we've done, you know, we've, we've tested all of these various different things, and the things that seem to explain it the most are, in fact, you know, where the, where the, gene, where the DNA is wrapped around protein affects how, how likely it is to mutate. Uh, the DNA sequence obviously has an effect on, on whether it's likely to mutate, and uh, recombination rate, so whether or not the gene recombines at a high frequency has effects on how likely it's going to mutate. We can explain about 90% of the variance in mutation rate using this kind of a statistical model. So basically, we're explaining most of the variation in mutation rate. And this is what it looks like when you look around the chromosome. We've never had the ability to, to, to estimate this before. So this is the first time we really can, can see how rates vary. And sure enough, you can have extended regions across a region of the genome that are very hot, and then you can have very cold spots. And now we have the ability to start looking into these hot spots and find out 
you know, what genes are mutating at high rates, what genes are mutating at low rates. Interestingly, we noticed this region, which is actually associated with Prader-Willi syndrome and autism, and this has a very high mutation rate. I'll, I'll jump, jump ahead to the, to the punchline here. Disease genes are hypermutable. And the more, basically, the more essential the gene, the higher the mutation rate. So dominant, genes that are associated with dominant disorders have, have higher mutation rates, and in fact, essential genes have the highest mutation rates, which was somewhat uh, paradoxical. So to summarize, hypermutability is a characteristic of the genome, and paradoxically, mutation rates are very high in some of our most essential and important genes. So the hypothesis that this raises is that the human genome seems to be favoring mutations within functional elements. And the human genome seems to be programmed, actually, to mutate in ways that are going to actually create di biological diversity in the population. So this comes to the notion that basically evolutionary selection for human traits might be a double-edged sword. So once something in the genome becomes important, essential, functional, somehow the genome seems to be adapting in such a way that mutation rates actually tend to go up, paradoxically, at those sites. So that concludes my talk, and I'd like to thank everyone in the lab, particularly Jake Michelson, who did all of the clever statistical work on the project, and of course, our, our colleagues, Beijing Genomics Institute, who, for doing all the genome sequencing. Thank you.